This talk is about the Peel of Kirkintilloch, which to me is a very special place. To reach it, you turn up Peel Bray from Kirkintilloch Cross, past the Old Kirk Museum on the left-hand side, and enter through the War Memorial Gates. These days, the Peel is fortunate to have an outstanding photographer, Edward Z. Smith, living close to its edge. His extensive local archive includes many images of the Kirkintilloch area and beyond. This is one of Edward's aerial views of the Peel. The talk will divide into six different themes listed here. Kirkintilloch Castle, the commons at Kirkintilloch, antiquarianism and archaeology, the work of P. MacGregor Chalmers, heroes of the war memorial, the lion in the park. To address the first theme, I will consider the substance of the medieval castle, its significance in the wars of independence, the peels created by Edward I of England, the siege of Kirkintilla Castle in 1306, the subsequent siege of Stirling Castle, and the unfortunate decline of the castle at Kirkintilla. This view shows a drawing of Kirkintilla Castle that was commissioned by Eastern Bartonshire Council for display in the Peel Park. Three significant components of the castle should be noted. A surrounding moat or ditch, a stone tower and a wooden fence or palisade. During his attempted conquest of Scotland, King Edward I of England was responsible for the wooden palisade. Unlike his policy of stone castle building in Wales, Edward didn't go about building stone castles in Scotland. Instead, he strengthened existing castles by the construction or renewal of surrounding palisades or peels. The one at Kirkintilloch is probably a renewal. Historians can access a good range of material relating to Kirkintilloch Castle in the time of Edward I, mostly from English sources. Some examples are listed here. These examples all relate to Sir William Francis, who was the constable of Kirkintilla Castle in the very earliest years of the 14th century. This list shows that, apart from Berwick and Linlithgow, Kirkintilla was one of the most significant Scottish castles held by Edward in the early years of the 14th century, at least in terms of a regular garrison. In 1302, Stirling Castle was still in Scottish hands, so the land between here and Stirling was very much a war zone. The stone palace at Lithgow did not exist in Edward's time. Instead, there were wooden palisades and earthen mounds, just like those at Kirkintilloch, the remains of which can be seen at Lithgow to this day. At Loch Maven, the remains of a later stone castle survive, but in Edward's day there would have been a wooden palisade on top of an earthen mound. Traces of this can also be seen at the present time. In 1306, Robert the Bruce killed his rival John Common and had himself crowned king. As it happens, John Common had been the laird of Kirkintilla Castle, but he also owned estates in other parts of Scotland. Here we see the banner of Bishop Robert Wishart of Glasgow, a loyal supporter of Robert the Bruce. In 1306, on Bruce's behalf, he laid siege to Kirkintilla Castle, using timber given to him for repair of Glasgow Cathedral to make siege engines. But this assault was unsuccessful and Kirkintilla Castle remained in English hands for a few more years. During this period, Sir Philip de Moubray became constable of Kirkintilla Castle on behalf of the English. De Moubray seems to have been highly regarded, for by February 1311 he had been promoted to the command of Stirling Castle, by then in English hands. He remained in charge there until the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, after which he was permitted to change sides, 
from the English to the Scots. This slide summarises the period of common family involvement in Kirkintilloch history, before they fell from grace in the reign of Robert the Bruce. Here we see the common family crest. The Commons' first recorded building at Kirkintilloch was a parish church, at that time situated at the Old Isle. The present belfry there was probably built of stones from the old church. In 1195, the common parish church at Kirkintilloch was granted to the abbots and canons of Cambus Kenneth Abbey near Stirling, shown here, as confirmed by a papal bull of Pope Celestine III. Some time after the church was established at the Old Isle, the commons built a castle at the Peel of Kirkintilloch. Around this time they also established a borough of barony at Kirkintilloch. The late Professor G. S. Pride suggested that the castle came before the borough, with the latter under the protection of the castle, as described in this slide. A mound containing the remains of the common castle can be seen in the Peel Park to this day. This is the southeast corner of the mound as it looked during the early years of the 20th century. And here as it is today. A charter for a borough of barony at Kirkintilloch was granted by King William the Lion to William Common in 1211. This medieval copy is in the Eastern Barkinshire archives at the William Patrick Library. It is fair to say that the written antiquarian and archaeological history of the Peel over the years has been quite colourful and varied. Sadly, until quite recent years, it was based on two errors. Firstly, that everything historical to be seen at the Peel is Roman, mainly comprising an Antonine Wall fort. Secondly, that the Antonine Wall, very unusually, ran along the southern edge of the fort. John Horsley, writing in 1733 in Britannica Romana, challenged the latter view, believing that it probably passed north of the fort, but nobody paid any heed to his view until very recent times. This is General Roy's plan of the Peel, dating from 1750. It shows the boundary ditch surviving in more complete state than it does today and a substantial stone building just inside the east gate, which is now turfed over in a grassy mound. Thanks to the good efforts of Professor Lawrence Kepi in publishing them, we can now access two drawings of the peel prepared by an English clergyman, the Reverend John Skinner, in 1825. Skinner was really the first antiquarian to challenge the view that the features surviving in the peel were entirely Roman. He suggested that the stone building near the southeast corner was more modern. However, Skinner's view was not shared by the surveyors working on the first edition of the Ordnance Survey map, published in 1864. The map describes the peel simply as remains of the Roman wall station. However, in 1899, an excavation confirmed that the high mound in Peel Park is the turfed over remains of a medieval castle. Early in the 20th century, Roman experts from the north of England had a look at the Peel and declared there was nothing Roman about it. In his book on the Antonine Wall, published in 1911, Scottish archaeologist Sir George MacDonald, shown here in a trench, admitted that there wasn't much evidence of Roman presence in the Peel, but suggested that the prime location and the regular interval sequence of other Antonine Wall forts remained as strong circumstantial evidence in favour of a fort at this location. Unfortunately, F. J. Haverfield, Professor of Ancient History at Oxford University, then pooh-poohed the very idea. 
even suggesting that cross-hatched Roman building stones found at the Peel might have been carried there from Auchendavy Fort, two miles away. In response, Sir George MacDonald carried out an excavation at the Peel in 1914 and found what he believed was conclusive proof of Roman presence, including some fragments of Roman pottery. Nevertheless, most of the specialists still believed that the course of the Antonine Wall through Kirkintilloch lay south of the Peel. This erroneous view was corrected by Professor Anne Robertson during the 1950s, when she found the stone base of the Antonine Wall close to the western boundary of the Peel Park, near the top of Camp Hill Avenue. This view shows people spectating at the excavation in Peel Park, with Union Street and St David's Church steeple in the background. This view shows the location of the excavation with the old William Patrick Library in the background. The excavation site lay open for many years, but Professor Robertson once told me that she believed that the trench should be filled in again to preserve the remains. In due course this came about, but in many ways this seems a pity. This view shows the site of an excavation that was carried out in 1979 under the auspices of Sir Kelvin District Council in the car park across the road from St Finian's Church. Very significantly, the archaeologists on this project discovered the remains of a Roman ditch curving to the south, which some archaeologists are convinced shows the south gate of the Roman fort. This shows a view of the back of St Ninian's Church looking south from the mound in Peel Park. If the discovery across the road from the church really was the south gate of the Roman fort, we might expect to find its headquarters building in this general vicinity. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be much chance of this now. The excavation of the Peel Mound by Peter MacGregor Chalmers in September 1899 is actually very significant, but because he did not leave behind a formal report, this work is often ignored by archaeologists. However, he delivered a public lecture on site, and this was reported in detail in the Kirkintilloch Herald of 20th September 1899. It makes fascinating reading. MacGregor Chalmers was an architect by profession, specialising in churches. Probably by coincidence, St David's Memorial Church, Kirkintilloch, was built to his designs during the 1920s. Chalmers showed very clearly that the high mound in the Peel Park is the grassed over remains of a substantially built stone medieval keep with walls 12 feet thick. Undoubtedly the castle of the commons that was garrisoned by English troops for a period. Chalmers proposed that the stone walls of the keep be consolidated and kept open as an interesting visitor attraction. But the death of his mentor, ex-provost John Cameron, at the end of 1899, seems to have put paid to this idea. So the castle was buried again and has remained buried ever since. After the end of the First World War in 1918, as in many other places, it was decided to build a war memorial in Kirkintilla. The matter was discussed in 1919 when the Peel Park was identified as a suitable location. Construction of a new baronial tower was discussed, but it was agreed that this would be too expensive. This image is of an earlier proposal for a new built castle at the Peel by Alexander Galloway in 1880. This seems to be something we can do well without. The War Memorial project stalled for a few years, but in 1923 Sir James Fletcher, a Kirkintilloch native who was a prominent building contractor in New Zealand, offered to provide a substantial quantity of New Zealand marble for the purpose and transport it to Kirkintilloch free of charge. 
Fletcher's offer was gratefully accepted, and this is the origin of the war memorial we can still see today. Carefully note the words, in remembrance, above the gate. This is an early drawing of the Kirkintilloch War Memorial in Peel Bray, prepared before it was erected. Note that the words above the gate are different. They read, Gates of Remembrance. This is because the Kirkintilloch War Memorial wasn't built to an original design. It was copied from the design used for the memorial at Westport on the South Island of New Zealand, on which the words were Gates of Remembrance. Having received the marble for the war memorial free of charge, the memorial trustees decided to spend the accumulated funding for the memorial on other things. They decided to create a clear vista for viewing the war memorial up Peel Bray. For this, the first task was to purchase and remove the former Salvation Army Hall at the foot of the Bray beside the Peel Cafe. This shows the deed of purchase of the hall building from Charles MacDonald and other members of his family, dated June 1923. Interestingly, one of the members of this particular MacDonald family was Margaret MacDonald Macintosh, wife of Charles Rennie Macintosh. The latter's signature as witness can be seen at the foot of this part of the document, with the signature of his wife, Margaret MacDonald Macintosh, to the right. So Eastern Bartonshire Archives has a Charles Rennie Macintosh autograph. After all this involvement by famous people, the monument was finally unveiled on a pouring wet day in April 1925 by Dr William B. Armstrong, a well-known local GP. Although the marble for the war memorial came from New Zealand, the cast iron gates were manufactured locally at the Lion Foundry. In this final part of the talk, we will examine the other Lion Foundry products that can be seen in the field park. This page from an early 20th century catalogue of Lion Foundry products shows the number 25 bandstand and the number 41 drinking fountain that were selected for display in the Peel in 1905. This image is a contemporary photograph of the drinking fountain soon after it was erected in the Peel in 1905. And as it is today. The plaque on the fountain confirms that it was the gift of ex-Bailey Robert Hudson a director of the Lion Foundry Company. Along with James Jackson and James Brown, Robert Hudson portrayed here was a founding partner in the Lion Foundry in 1880. He was personally responsible for the foundry's diversification into an interesting range of ornamental cast iron work, including bandstands and fountains, but much more besides. The Lion Foundry bandstand in the Peel was the gift of Bailey David Perry, a member of Kirkintilla Town Council from 1893 until 1911, during the last three years of which he was provost. David Perry was a manufacturing chemist with a factory at Kirkintilla Canal Basin. This portrait shows him in later life. It is worth remembering that Colsice also has a Lion Foundry fountain and bandstand set, displayed in Burn Green Park. The Colsice fountain is a number 41 fountain, identical to the one in Peel Park. Although made in the Lion Foundry, Colsice bandstand is of a different design to the one in Peel Park. I have been taking photographs of the Peel for many years. I find that it looks quite different at different times of the year. This winter view was taken in the 1980s when I was working at the old William Patrick Library, just a few steps away. 
and this is a very recent view taken in the autumn of 2020. This booklet on the Peel was published by the Antiquaries in 2012. It is intended to publish a new edition in due course.